afternoon's session on the Chicago Teachers Union Strike and Social Movement Unionism and the Defense of Public Education. My name is Tom Alter. I'm a graduate student pursuing my PhD in U.S. labor history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, I was also a member of the Chicago Teachers Solidarity Campaign. Um, we have an excellent panel lined up here. And um, in the interest of time, so we can get to everyone on the panel, hopefully get to some of your discussions, I will not be giving the normal comment session. Uh, they'll just be chairing. But if you are interested in what I have to say about the Chicago Teachers <laughs> Union Strike, a little bit of promotion. Um, I've got an article coming up in Lasha's next journal, um, Labor, on the Chicago Teachers Union Strike. So you can be looking for that in August. Um, so now I'll be a little brief bio of each of our um, panelists, and then we'll get to it. Um, I'm just going to go and what I have right here, this is necessarily the order of speakers. Um, we have Stephen Ashby, who's the second from the left down there. He is a full clinical professor at the University of Illinois Labor Education Program and has been a first community-based and then a university-based labor educator for 20 years. Um, the Chicago Labor Education Program has been deeply involved with the CTU, the Chicago Teachers Union, since early 2010. He has led multiple classes for the Chicago Teachers Union teacher, activist, and newly elected leadership, was a leader, was a lead producer on a video for the, union, for the union, meeting challenges past and present, and has been consulting with the union to assist the planning and implementation of their 2011-2012 contract campaign and strike strategy. He attended weekly organizing meetings of, with the CTU staff and is also on the steering committee of the Chicago Teachers Solidarity Campaign. Um, Stephen. We also have Megan Benner. She is a high school English teacher in Brooklyn and a PhD candidate in English literature at Sony Stony Brook. She is a longtime union activist in, with the United Federation of Teachers delegate from her school. She is a frequent contributor to socialistworker.org on labor and education issues and has also been published in Labor Notes, New Politics, and the Harvard Educational Review. I'm Peter Morgan, down here at the far end of the right. He is a PhD candidate um, at, uh, in geography at York University. He was in Chicago, um, that's how I met him, um, for the six months leading up to the CTU strike, doing research on the role that education, restructuring, and teacher unions have been playing in the making of global cities and contemporary capitalism. Brian Jones in the middle, um, is a teacher, actor, and activist in New York City. He has been a public elementary school teacher in Harlem for eight years. He is on the board of directors of the nonprofit organization Voices of a People's History of the United States, funded by Howard Zinn and Anthony Arno. Um, currently, Jones is pursuing a PhD in education at CUNY. Um, we also have Becca Bohr, right here. and she is a high school teacher in the Chicago Public School System, and she is a member of CORE, the Caucus of Rank and File Educators, and is an activist in Chicago. Um, finally, we also have um, Michael Fabricant at the end down here. He is a faculty member at Hunter College. Um, and he's also the treasurer of the Professional Staff Congress, which is the union that represents the staff of um, CUNY professors. And he's the author of Changing Politics of Education, Privatization, and the Dispossessed Lives Left Behind. And so with that, we're going to kick off with Brian. Well, thanks. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to try to be extremely brief, because um, I think that... Brian going? Oh, oh, we're here? Okay, sure. Yeah. I think it's... Well, I'm up here already. So. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Um, well, I'll try to be extremely brief. I imagine that my panelists have a whole lot more to say than I. My particular window into this is as someone who, as a member of the teachers union here, the United Federation of Teachers, is also part with Megan of a caucus called the Movement of Rank and File Educators. Um, we are a or in Chicago, there's core, a thinly veiled copycat attempt. Um, and so what we've been engaged in here in the teachers union is a process of trying to figure out what, practically speaking, from the standpoint of classroom teachers and nurses and UFT members, practically speaking, what are some of the operating conclusions? Um, and it occurs to me that in, in, from our discussions and from things we've read and discussed, and so I'm speaking here as, from, as for myself, um, but certainly what I'm saying reflects many discussions that we, the movement of rank-and-file educators, have had, is that the, the Chicago Teachers Union strike broke the mold of the 
labor movement in many different ways. It broke the mold of the labor movement's relationship to the Democratic Party. It broke the mold of labor's strategy for how it's going to get what it wants in this world. It broke the mold in its relationship to parents and to the wider public of non-union members who in that crucial moment had their back and supported them. In many different ways, the Chicago Teachers Union strike changed the script of what it is that unions are supposed to do in an election year with the Democratic Party, with people who are not union members, and what it is that they practically do to fight and win. And as we've started to discuss, essentially the way we see the Chicago Teachers Union strike is a different vision of unionism altogether that is focused on building grassroots power, um, which is very different from other union strategies that have been about consolidation um, and concentration of power at the top. Um, uh, I'm thinking of change to win, for example. And that when you start thinking about the Chicago Teachers Union strike from that perspective, then it's, what's interesting is that all the little things are different all along the way. And I just want to speak about one and then sit down. The one that really struck me was not, not only the way they advanced, not only the way they fought, but the way they retreated. That is, they concluded the strike giving two extra days out on strike primarily for the purpose of allowing the members to read and discuss the contract on the picket lines. So the members had an opportunity to turn this over before going back to work and saying, do we want to go back to work on these terms or not? Contrast that with something we've experienced recently here in New York, the transit strike, for example, which was led by what had previously been an insurgent leadership, but where, and you know, I, I was not a transit worker at the time, but I was certainly a frequent participant on the picket lines. But I remember when, this, when the strike was concluded, the workers on the picket line had no idea what they were getting going back to work. They were completely in the dark about what was going to be in that contract. And I think there's something about the way that they handed over this question to the membership that also broke the mold. Broke the mold from managing the members to empowering the members. And I know that empowerment is an, an overused and abused word, but here I mean it in a genuine way. That is that even if we say, even if, and when you look at the terms of the contract, it's not all great stuff. I mean, there's, there's certainly defeats in there. There's certainly setbacks in there. There's, there's a difference between saying, you know what, this is great. Oh, this is great, everything's great. We're gonna be evaluated on test scores. It's great, actually it's great, it's fair. There's a difference between saying that and saying, you know what, this is not great but it's what we've got at this stage of the struggle. This is what will allow us to live and fight another day, and we, we, we retain our critical faculties. We allow the members to retain criticism and a standpoint of criticism towards some things that are in the contract, but we accept the contract because we're gonna live, or rather we, we put it out to, are we going to accept this contract on the basis of living to fight another day? And I think that that kind of a perspective it, to me, not only, again, in the fighting and in the advancing and in the marching and in the, all of that, but in, in making an orderly retreat and preserving one's forces, um, that now you see that the Chicago Teachers Union is by far, and I'm sure Becca's going to talk about this, not out of the woods at all. They're being hammered. They're being absolutely hammered. And so the fact that the members' critical stance, cr criticism of the contract, criticism of the terms of it has been preserved is really important because now, essentially, they're back in a position where they have to renew another round of fighting. And so I think we should really celebrate that aspect, that bottom-up vision, um, and look at that as a model for future negotiations in other of our unions. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks to Stephen. I have handouts. <laughs> so this will be much more useful to you if you email me and I email it back to you. And then you just double click on the link. So if you're teaching about the strike, I thought you might find a number of uh, web, links, web, web links useful. So I've given a number of talks on the CTU and usually they're chronological themes. I thought I would just talk about themes today. 
So being a professor, I run too long of a talk, so Tom's going to cut me off. I have 10 points, but that means 90 seconds on each. We'll see what we can do. 10 themes, 10 lessons. You know, when I teach labor history, I hand out to a unionist or a uh, undergrad 16 lessons of labor history for our struggles today, for our life today. So I think lessons of every struggle are very, very valuable. The first I would start with actually might be a little unusual, that the leadership and the organizers were very keen, very adamant that the central problem they faced was not apathy, was not indifference, it was a, a sense of lack of hope, the sense of can we do this, do we have any power, what is the point? Uh, <clears throat> and this is what they struggled against from the beginning. And you could, you could brought that out nationally, we could have a discussion about is that the central problem nationally with the working class and why there isn't more activism. But the problem wasn't teachers that were disinterested or didn't care or didn't think they were under attack. Uh, the problem, the core, when it started as a study group and then began to fight school closings for two years and then ran through leadership and took power and built a contract campaign, the problem they faced was organizing workers, teachers, educators, convince them that they could fight and win. And so it was tens of thousands of conversations. And the amount of conversations that went on, the, the discussions that went on to convince people, you need to be involved and we will win. If we fight, we will win. The second point I would argue as a theme is contract campaigns work. Now in my field of work, that's one of the main things we teach about. How to educate, organize, and mobilize the members to fight back against the boss. Uh, traditional business unionism sees bargaining as skilled bargainers. And actually the opposition to core that was defeated 4-1 to one in the last election pretty much campaigned on that. We're better bargainers, we're more skilled. If you elect us, we'll do a better job. Uh, which of course is, is just bullshit. Um, the contract campaign is, is, again, tens of thousands of conversations. It's a strategic plan, a strategy to organize the membership. They feel Committees in 600 schools, unevenly, not all perfect. Um, but with the idea that every member would be in touch with a member of that committee, that th those conversations would go on, those people would be asked to get involved, those people would be asked to join the committee and become leaders. And you know, really, when we talk about contract campaigns today as historians, if we met, went back to 1912 and talked to someone in the IWW, or 1938 and talked to someone in the CIO and we explained it to them, they'd probably say, What are you calling it that for? We just call that organizing. Um, but since we stopped internal organizing, we have a new name for it, contract campaigns. And as soon as the leadership took power on June 10, they began a systematic campaign uh, to organize their membership. It had been a militant union in the 70s and 80s, uh, but the last strike was 26 years ago. And that militant history was a pretty distant memory. And under the administration caucus that ruled for most of the years since, the members have been demobilized. Uh, the district supervisors, as they were called, who became the strike coordinators in previous strikes, really had no role. Uh, there was no outreach to the community. There was no outreach significantly to the parents. There was no real leadership training, no mentoring of new leaders, no education of the membership. And the issues were narrowly focused. Give us a better contract. Not fighting to defend public schools. Uh, so this is a huge problem. 26,000 members in 600 buildings. Uh, it would be a big enough problem to have 1,000 members in one building. 600 buildings. So they, they set about systematically to cut the salaries of the officers to whom they were elected. They hired an organizing staff, all of whom were teachers except for one. They began to use the district supervisors, each was responsible for roughly 12 schools, as an intermediary leadership and train them to be leaders of the campaign. They had three delegate conferences. There's a delegate in each school. In high schools, there's more than one, so there are 800 delegates. They use these delegate conferences to, to train about contract campaigns. If any of you have seen the Teamster video, Power at Work, uh, it was utilized, it's on the, on the web, about how to organize a contract campaign. And they began to organize in the schools. And they told people, take initiative. Brainstorm what you could do. You want to march on your alderman? March, that's our city council people. March on your alderman. You want to go door to door in the neighborhood? That sounds great. You figure out ways to organize in your community among your school. Of course, the, the red shirts are very common in contract campaigns is you just wear a union shirt. Every Friday you wear a red union shirt or just red something. Uh, it's a very simple, small thing to do, but it, it took off for the teachers. It was an extremely powerful part of building that unity and that empowerment, that sense of uh, you can change things. 
The third point I say, the third theme is the best practices of union organizing tell us how to organize our members in an existing union. We always teach about this when we teach about contract campaigns and labor education. Uh, and the union hired Matt Luskin away from SEIU Healthcare, who had been a union organizer and knew how to do this very well, and he brought those skills in. Um, when I teach contract campaigns or internal organizing, I always hand out a short article by Bob Camp from 1991 called Organizing Never Stops. You could Google it. Um, and he talks about how we know how to organize new workers. We build a broad worker committee. It's diverse. We kind of rank the workers lead the committee. The staff assists. They don't dominate. We rank all the workers. We're constantly in conversations. We're going to their homes and house calls. We're meeting with them. What are, the, what are your issues? What are your concerns? It's constant organizing. We reach out to the community. We build support. We have actions on the job. We know how to do union organizing successfully. His article basically says, but somehow, as a labor movement, we completely, we, it's like, he says, playing baseball and football. We, then when we win, we just forget all that. And we don't do any of that. So a contract campaign basically draws on all the successful lessons of union organizing. And one of the, one of the most you know, important things is ranking people. So step by step, the union went building by building, member by member, to rank, where are they? How much involved are they? What are the obstacles? Where do we have a tyrannical principle? And every time they did an action, that was part of it. One of the goals of the actions, of course, would be, uh, for example, the May 23rd rally of 6,000 people downtown, which was incredible. The May 10th practice strike vote, uh, the three-day June strike vote, the first wave of Teachers and informational picket lines, a third of the schools started early. The next wave of all the other, rest of the schools doing informational picket lines. One goal is always show the mayor and the school board we are unified, we are determined. This is not a top-down union. This is not a paper tiger. Second goal is show the public the union is fighting for them. It is fighting for the parents. It is fighting for the kids. Uh, a third goal of every action was have the members feel their power. That they are leading this fight. You could, you know, just like the May 23rd rally in the auditorium at Roosevelt Auditorium in Congress downtown. You could just, as, as the auditorium was started to fill up, you could just feel the sense of change among people because they're all thinking, "We've never done this before. Is this going to fail? This is a huge auditorium, and we all know, you know, if you get 500 people in an auditorium of 4,000, this is not going to look good." But the red shirt, they're coming in and they, they begin to fill the auditorium, and then they fill the first floor, and then they fill the second, and then they fill the third, and the chants that went up, and the cheers, and then we went out and marched with the overflow crowd of 2,000, we met another rally of 3,000, uh, organized by Stand Up Chicago. Could, oh, the people I talked to, just the smiles, like, we did this thing. Look at us, look at us, you know? Uh, I tried to get some chants going. Everybody just wanted to chant CTU, CTU, CTU. It was just a feeling of, unbelievable power. We did this thing. But a fourth goal of every action was, this comes from union organizing, how did it go? We don't just go home and sleep. How did it go? Where were we weak? Which building didn't turn out people? Who didn't send a bus to the action? When we're having a practice strike authorization vote, who didn't uh, turn out a lot of people? Of course, the mayor and the Democrats throughout the state passed Senate Bill 7 saying only they need 75% of the members to uh, authorize a strike. Instead of 50% plus one, 75% of the entire membership. Which is a good and a bad thing. Of course, it's overwhelmingly bad on Democratic dictatorial. The good thing is it's like a knife in your back, you organize or die. Uh, and that was an impetus. So, for example, another example, when it came to the three-day strike vote, which most unions don't have, the final authorization vote, they usually one day. And they needed that 75%. So there's the big, I was there for the four days we were, I was observing the counting of the ballots. And then there's a war room, a much smaller room, with, just filled with wall with every school. And they don't really care uh, the yes and no vote, because they know the yes is overwhelming. They care about reaching that 75%, so they care about how many people turned out. So the next morning, uh, with organizers, several dozen from SEIU Healthcare, they send 50 people out to the weakest schools at 6 in the morning, handing out flyers. This is, this is the techniques of union organizing. You rank, you study, where are we weak, where are we weak, put resources in there. The fourth point, which Brian talked about, which is so essential, is the members must lead. And Karen Lewis and the entire leadership and the organizing team and the core were uh, completely on board with us from the beginning and drove this forward. 
you know, we have debates in labor sometimes. Actually, most union leaders never talk about democracy, but when they do, occasionally someone will say something they probably regret. It doesn't matter. It's not that important. We're like an army. We need to have generals. Armies aren't democratic. And, and the CTU completely proved the, the stupidity of this. I don't know. I'm probably going to have a debate about this anymore. And just a few examples. So we're at the Labor Day rally uh, the week before the strike. The CTU called. The CFL, of course, was in. Democratic Party convention, so they did not call anything on Labor Day. Um, and the Fraternal Order of Police had Michael Shields gives a speech. Interesting, he's there, but you know their pensions are under attack too. And he says, Karen did it all. Karen's amazing. She's the greatest president, which which is pretty interesting that FOP believe the president would say that. There's like 15,000 people there. Karen stands up, the President of the Union says, no way. You don't understand. The members did this. The members built our power. So, you know, thank you for the accolades, but it was not me. It was our people. Which is what a leader should say. A second example, you know, all the organizing meetings I was at, Karen was not there. She, she had no need to micromanage everything. She's basically, I got good people. I trust them. They know what to do. You know, she's, of course, leading the union, but I don't need to micromanage. She trusted people. The officers trusted people. They trusted their staff. They trusted their organizers. A third example at the, uh, the monthly district supervisor meetings. The, the question was always to the delegates, step up, take leadership, take initiative, develop your own tactics. Um, the, uh, Ryan mentioned the, you know, the, the seventh day of the strike. I mean, the, the story is that, I'm um, probably still in some of the <laughs> the, the, the real story is, you know, if the union had any mistakes or flaws, I, I would say one of them was Karen led the media, made statements on Friday and Thursday saying it's basically over, we're near a contract. Um, and so when they came Sunday to the delegates meeting, um, the delegates said no. Uh, first, the big bargaining team, the rank and file team of 30, voted two to one to say no. Karen, no. And then the delegates, so they were ready, the officers were ready for the mass delegate meeting of 800 who said, no, we're going to these, we'll take it back to the members, so we'll go through it point, point, point. Have we won enough for the parents? That's what the conversations were. I, Becca was at one, but I drove around delivering strike bulletins for those two days and talked with people in those circles in front of the schools, having those conversations. They were very intent. They were very, they went on for hours. Very serious democracy. And Karen could have reacted like, you know, F you people, I'm the president of this union, we decide this is a good contract, we don't need to be out there. I mean, you know, frankly, even progressive unions will probably respond that way. And she was like, okay. You know, we told you you run this union, you're, you're telling us you run the union? You know, I'm kind of proud of you. Well, so we'll go on for another two days for this discussion. Or even uh, going back in time when Senate Bill 7 was passed, uh, where Karen endorsed it. She was outmaneuvered and uh, made a mistake. She said she made a mistake. And it came back in the executive board, but also the core caucus that Becca's part of. So what the hell did you do that for? Uh, and they repudiated. They, didn't, they went from endorsing to denouncing this law. Uh, you know, I think Karen thought it would have been banning the right to strike if she hadn't passed it. But there was no faction fight. There was no internal break, which is so common in caucuses. Um, caucuses usually don't survive. They usually fall apart, especially after they, after they win. How much time do I have time? Make sure you get the teacher up there. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make it to five points, and then I'll just tell you what the other five are. The fifth point is the message. And, you know, we had a debate, again for historians, between the AFL and the Knights of Labor over this. So we had a debate between the AFL and the IWW, then we had a debate between the AFL and the CIO, and then the CIO merged and we lost the debate. Do unions stand for justice for everyone, or do we stand for just us? Do we stand for justice or just our people? And in the past, the union in Chicago stood for just its people. And Mayor Daley had thrown money at the union, and they'd done nothing on any other issue. They'd given it on every other issue. And that's the history of Chicago. You throw money, and you threaten and intimidate. That's what Mary Emanuel did. And, and, you know, so in many ways, this was two types of bargaining. It was the mayor expecting standard bargaining, and we'll throw money, and you won't go on strike. And it was the union, driven by the members, saying this is a struggle for the soul of public education. We're sick to death of being demonized. 
you people are evil. You know, so it was, this, it was like two ships passing in the night the way they approached bartering. And the union from the beginning was very good on messages. They talked to the members on message. If you watch the television coverage as I did over and over and over again, teachers would say, I'm a, what do you want to strike for? I'm on strike for a nurse in my school. I'm on strike for a smaller classroom. I'm on strike for a social worker in my school. Why is it good enough for the mayor's kids? Why is it good enough for every suburban school, but it's not good enough for our kids? Maybe it's because they're all black and Hispanic and you've abandoned, just like capitalism was abandoned for a whole damn uh, working class, and particularly black and Latino. I'm fighting for air conditioning in my school. How do you expect me to teach when it's 100 degrees in there? And on and on. Now, of course, the union cannot say that. Only legally, they can only strike over compensation issues. So every officer and every flyer they handed out said, the union is not a strike over matters governed exclusively by IELRA section 4.5 of 12B. <laughs> you know, so you don't get an injunction thrown at you, although the government mayor was going to do that anyway. But the officers and the members over and over said, this is a struggle for public education. We are fighting for the parents, we are fighting for the kids. This is a war on public education. It's not just about more money for us or what's for us. It's about what's for the working class in the city. And this, you know, this is, this is messaging. This, I've been in labor meetings where it gets attacked. You're talking about PR, you're talking about branding, it's advertising. Uh, but the right wing is extremely good at this, and labor and the left wing are pretty damn weak at it. Uh, but the Chicago Teachers Union taught us a lot about messaging, uh, about how to tell our message. Uh, and it has to come from your gut, it can't be a lie. And also just calling what it is, a racist educational system. Okay, so that's my five points. So my sixth point, which I won't talk about maybe in discussion, was basically the people united will never be defeated. And as they began as a caucus, it was working to fight school closures. It wasn't an electoral site in the beginning. And they built relationships with community groups. Uh, I'm part of grassroots education movement. Uh, the Chicago Teacher Solidarity Campaign that Beck and I and Tom were part of. 110 people at our first founding meeting in June of last year formed to build solidarity in the community. Uh, and this union just worked tirelessly. And so when you say, how did they get two-thirds of the parents five days into a strike supporting the teachers? Well, it didn't happen through uh, uh, press conferences and emails. It happened through door-to-door -door and talking to parents and organizing with the, the community and having two dozen... Okay, I'm sorry. The seventh message is go to the streets. So I can elaborate on that, but I won't. The eighth <laughs> point is don't be afraid to come in front of the Democratic Party. Brian already talked about, which they did. They had a tremendous array of forces against them. And you know, when you're fighting the Republicans, it's pretty damn bad, like in Wisconsin. But when you're fighting the Democrats, it's harder in many, many ways. It confuses people. The ninth point I would say is the AFL CIO was a bystander. Again, for our historians, we know the 1934 citywide strikes came from below. And they pushed the labor movement at the top to change. They didn't come from the top. And this struggle came from below. It was not what Randy Weingarten wanted. And they did their best in the AFT national headquarters to derail this thing. It came from below. It pushed from below. And the last point, which I would have talked about, was uh, as historians, we talk about how consciousness changes. You can see it with these teachers. The power they felt, the radicalization they went on, the chance they used, and how their consciousness changed. How through struggle, people radicalize, and they're never the same. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So um, I'll be real quick because I know y'all want to hear the teacher from Chicago, who's actually a member of the rank and file caucus that has transformed the union so far and given us great inspiration. And given us, at least for me personally, has validated my own kind of perspective, my political perspective as a rank and file activist in unions. And, and a lot of what we've been saying on the left in labor studies and, and folks in, in different um, you know, rank and file moves about building, um, reinventing unions with rank and file members at the center. But I want to say just a couple of things that I think there's been a lot of analysis written about the strike, written about the CTU. And, and today, too, I think it, it's missing something. And that's what I do. I'm a geographer. And I think what validated my existence as a geographer, who's radical, 
is that the CTU has been using radical geography to, to rekindle the spirit of the working class struggle in Chicago. And also to kind of, you know, in many different respects. So I've been in meetings on the South Side before the strike when they had these beautiful maps that they were helping, and it tells, you know, the picture tells a thousand words kind of thing, that outlaid the foreclosures that have happened since 2008 with the, the crisis in the housing market with the schools that were being targeted in the South and West Side, and, and it maps directly on, right? So it, it's not just about that the people that are being most affected um, by the education restructuring that's been going down in Chicago and in other American cities for the past 20 years, it's not just that they're affecting uh, African American and poor Latino populations, but it's completely transforming neighborhoods and cities. And this is how it's working in conjunction with the real estate industry. And this is how it's worked in conjunction with all these different parties, right? So politically, that's super important. Another perspective uh, in terms of the, the critical spatial analysis and the geographical analysis that the CTU was engaged in um, under the leadership of CORE was really thinking through the politics of particular neighborhoods, right? And again, this is another lesson when people try to talk about what can we learn from the CTU, what can we learn from CORE. There are general lessons, but the one general lesson I want to say is study your city, know your neighbors, know the politics of what's going on in this particular school, in that particular neighborhood, how, how education apartheid, and this is what the CTU very you know, controversially has called it, and I think rightly so, how it's organized in the city. Right? How, how is it working in conjunction with gentrification, urban development, the production of a global city in ways that are different than it's working in New York? or in LA, or in Toronto, where we're from. Um, these are really important questions that I think the CTU on the course leadership to the forefront, and you know, that we need to think about as we try to generalize and think about how do we build more, for example, in New York. My, my dissertation is a comparative study, and you know, trying to think through these questions. Like the way, the, the history of, of the CTU versus the UFT, for example, radically different, and this in particular around the race relations in the city. And, you know, but also around, you know, and it's tied up with how each union won collective bargaining, the relationship with the civil rights movement, and so forth. Right? These, these are really important questions that continue to haunt us today. Um, a couple other things I want to say, is, and, and Steve touched on this, is that the fact, and a lot of people have missed this out, and I, I know I have some people disagree with me on this, but the fact that CORE maintained the caucus, and all the leaders in CORE, and emphasis on as they take over the union and prepare for the biggest battle of their lives, that they have to build that caucus and continue to grow and make sure that's there. And I think we should celebrate the product of doing that strategy because they just won, you know, office again, which is that hasn't happened for 20 years. Every time uh, around the bargaining ends, the current leadership has been displaced in the past 20 year period or so. That didn't happen this time. They won by over 80 percent. We should celebrate that. It's incredible because it allows them to continue to reinvent the union with the rank and file at the center. So that, that I think is another lesson. Like we can't <laughs> once you win the leadership of your union and you try to institute changes both from above and below, you don't just fold up the tent. <laughs> um, and if they had done that, SB7, you know, they wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have rolled back, they wouldn't have changed their position on that the terrible bill um, that was trying to break the union. Made it necessary to get 75% of the bargaining uh, unit to vote in support of a strike to go on it. Um, so that's one example. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just kind of end with that because I think those are the two of the key aspects. We're thinking about, you know, not just studying the history of our union, but knowing the, the geography of the city, how things are relating to kind of a, a really uh, revanchist capitalist development. As it about controlling poor people and especially people of color, not just dumping the kind of responsibility of reproducing themselves onto them individually, because I think that's another problem. Actually, letting people die, right? Structuring neighborhoods in such a way that you, the political elites that are implementing these policies see these populations as surplus, surplus humanity, right? That aren't worthy of education or health or decent housing and so on. Uh, and those things are different in, if we look at a city like New York. That, that is happening, but there are some key differences, and we need to understand that as we build a movement to transform our unions, right, and, and, and rekindle the movement in the 
city. So maybe let's end there and pass it on to the next speaker. Talk a little bit. Signal that sent, 
and again, uh, very different from the way most unions um, are run today. And I think the most important thing, really, is the question of social movement um, unionism and the kind of relationship between um, unions and social justice struggles, which, again, I think for far too long has been kind of separated. So that there was a real sense, it's said that this is a strike against racism. It was a strike um, for justice against the kind of sterilization of education that we've seen. Um, and it's something that's a long history, I think, in, in particularly in teacher unions, but one that we haven't actually um, talked about. I mean, the fact that tenure is under attack, when tenure was one under, for many reasons, but partly as a women's rights issue, because um, in you know a field where women were the dominant um, workers, you could be fired for things like getting married. My grandmother was fired from a position, a home economics teacher, and was fired for getting married in South Texas. Um, so that these issues do go hand in hand in the way that we're if not talked about. And as we said, the history of New York, right, it's both a positive example of what um, Chicago has done. You know, New York does have the, the history of what happens if you don't take up those issues. And the 1968 kind of Ocean Hill Brownsville strike in terms of separating that, that has had decades long kind of repercussions um, in terms of the, the, the rift that's created between uh, the union communities, which we're still kind of overcoming um, today or trying to. And, and I think that that, so, I, mean, that I think that the, in terms of some of the takeaway, um, that's one of the, really one of the most important things that I think Moore has also tried to do. Moore calls itself the Social Justice Caucus of the UFT, um, and our kind of slogan on all our teachers is that our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. Um, and I think what, you know, think about what does that mean very concretely, it's both, you know, beyond uh, issues of like the tenure is not just about a teacher protection issue, it's about allowing teachers to advocate for their students. Um, that teacher evaluations aren't just about getting rid of bad teachers or more than good teachers, it's also going to be more testing for our students and a stripping down of the curriculum there and pressure on teachers, which goes straight into the classroom. But also, you know, that school closings are an issue that's very much related to like it's racism um, and, you know, I think it's really important. And, but even beyond that, the idea that housing is actually an education issue. My school has seen an incredible rise in the number of students who are in temporary housing that has a very real impact on my classroom and my students' ability to succeed. And so those are things that I think we need to figure out how to take up more broadly. That, um, you know, the, the criminalization of youth and things like, you know, stop and frisk has a huge impact on our students. And we need to be able to put forward alternatives um, and talk about, you know, fight against the school to prison pipeline, which is something that's been important, um, fight for other models, you know, for things like restorative justice and other things like that. Um, you know, and even healthcare, right? You know, healthcare is an education issue. If students don't have access to healthcare, if students, um, you know, have, you know, the, the rise in asthma in the city alone, what does that have an impact in terms of classroom? And I think part of what is really exciting about this meeting and the present is that for the first time we are actually talking about um, these kinds of issues in a way of looking at victories um, that are in the present that we can begin to generalize from and begin to kind of look at. And I also think that there's a potential really for um, the beginning of a national fight back. In many ways, um, you know, Chicago is the blueprint in terms of the attacks on education. Um, everything that was tried there has been brought um, here. Um, but it's also now kind of the blueprint for how you begin to fight back around that. And I think increasingly we're seeing after those kinds of decades of that tax, beginnings of fights um, around testing that are starting to be national fights um, against testing that unite parents and teachers and students um, and teachers around the country trying to discuss together what does it mean to actually support each other and build these kinds of united fights. And I think there's, there's a real potential in that and it gives a sense, you know, for the first time in a long time that, um, you know, both of why these fights are so important but also that these are fights that we can actually win. Victory. We've had a couple this year, but that victory 
was that 60% of our faculty voted and 92% voted no confidence in a curricular scheme that would have cheapened the curriculum for the City University of New York, which is called Pathways, which is a national phenomenon. So this sort of is a spirit fighting back, and that vote is but one stage in a very long, I suspect, protracted struggle. So I want to quickly move through what I think are the parallels. Uh, I start with the fact that, and some of this we all know, that part of what's going on for higher education in K-12 is what I would describe as globalization and the higher se hyper-segmentation of the labor force by race, by class, and by surplus labor status. And they're sliding folks to expansive parts of the low-wage labor market. That's what's expansive. And access is in conjunction with that globalization, be it to charter schools, right, on the one hand, or to the highly segmented colleges that exist at CUNY, where we move from community colleges to comprehensive to the elites. We're in an ever more speeded up and expansive mode of disposability, that fundamentally what we're looking at ever larger parts of the population that are being defined. And this echoes what's already been said, disposable. And that's only for K-12. It's going on very powerfully within public higher education. And that profit making is an intensifier of every one of those trends because fundamentally what we're looking at is the capitalization of public goods. Right? In a moment of economic crisis, what we're looking at is really to some extent, to some large extent, the opportunity to capitalize those public goods. I don't care if it's a for-profit charter, if it's Pearson, right, or if it, in fact, has to do with online education in a relationship to coursing. Part of what we're looking at is that capitalization. What's the reform agenda? Technology becomes a synonym for innovation. And the presumption is that technology is neutral. And it's, of course, we all know, never neutral, depending upon who, in fact, controls the technology. K through 12, the technology is to raise test scores, testing is science, virtual learning and accountability schema are presented as science and as a part of a technology. In higher education, online learning, new curricular re-engineering, and finally learning by objective. And the parallels are quite complete in relationship to both. Two. There's an intensified exploitation of labor. That's what, that's what teacher bashing is about. You bash them, you exploit them, and you reduce their wages and their benefits simultaneous to the degradation of the working conditions within the schools. And then in higher education, we see the rapid expansion of part-time labor. Rapid expansion, which is at this point only 27 to 29% of all, ten, all faculty positions are tenure-bearing lines, and at CUNY, over 50% of all courses are taught by part-time faculty labor. And I don't have to go any further than that. You know what that story is. The cheapening of curricula through testing. I don't need to go any further. Anyone that's been in a school, taught in a school, close to a school, knows what that's about. Graduation rate emphasis is the metric within universities public ones. That will be the metric. How quickly can we move them to graduation? And if we don't invest in those students coming out of K-12 through who come with learning challenges, then in fact what it means is we have to refigure a curricula to move people through more quickly on the basis of cheapened curricula and lowered standards. And it's the conjunction between college readiness and college graduation rates. That perhaps is the single most critical issue facing us right now. The capitalization of public goods. I've spoken obliquely to that. Uh, and I would say that higher education is the most strategically positioned institution publicly for the capitalization of public goods. Why? We've already segmented our universities on the basis of those that are most elite. That's what Corsi is in the midst of. We have a technology that has reach across the globe. And the only piece that hasn't been figured out, and it's, the presumption is this, le this stage of capitalist development is about knowledge distribution. The only piece that hasn't been figured out is how to make a profit off it. That still hasn't been unlocked. Cheapen degrees is part of, uh, this as well, from college readiness and K-12 ex experience to the evisceration of remedi remedia, uh, remediation 
um, and the reduction of investment in students, quicker movement of graduation within a context of diluted curriculum and learning challenges, pathways to support of that within our school. But how do you sell that reform? How do you sell it? Same in K-12 as higher ed. First, you start with the chant of social justice. Access to those who need it. Charter schools, access to quality education with higher investment. Online learning, access and reach. Equity made available to the poorest citizens nationally and internationally. Upgrading of quality. And finally, redistribution of resources, not based upon a collective responsibility, but the fact that individual entrepreneurs step up to do the work. The mythologizing of the exemplar. Isn't that what charter schools has been about? Whether they're exemplars or not is another question. You take KIPP, you take Uncommon Ground, you take any of them where they've uh, presumably increased that, you mythologize them, you make them, in fact, the norm, when in fact we have aggregated data from Credo at Stanford, which, which refutes the notion that charters even on their own terms and on testing, do better than public schools, but you continue to advance the exemplar as the norm. And of course, then after they become the norm, you work to scale them up. And the same thing is happening in higher ed. San Jose, California, online learning. In a circumstance where statistics will be the course, that will be atomized, it's a perfect fit for online learning, not humanities or social sciences, you atomize it, you create the basis for learning the statistics, you prove that you do as well if not better online, and it's cheaper, and then you scale it up across, vertically and horizontally. What are the impacts? Well, to begin with, you have a locked out commons, otherwise known, you know, well, for example, to call it a commons, a public area. How does that happen in K through 12? Dropouts, attrition, uh, parental engagement and charters. Graduation rates, concentration of difficult students in public schools because other students have been siphoned off into charters, all are part of being locked out of the commons. How has it happened in higher education? Graduation becomes more difficult on the basis of debt. I haven't even talked about debt because I don't have time. Dropping out, the choice not to attend uh, because of higher tuition and the rationing of space. Then from locked out, we shut down the schools. Right? Because we create self-fulfilling prophecies of failure. So we schools are deemed failures, and I don't need to go into that in K through 12. We know about that in school closings. But let me talk a little bit about higher ed, because that's the show that's coming to us. Intensified competition on the basis of online learning and the reach in public higher education to groups of students otherwise unavailable nationally and internationally as well as regionally is going to be mean that some universities and colleges are no longer going to be able to compete on that basis. And that competition will be based upon certain kinds of standards. We will begin to see the shutting down of universities and colleges on that basis because of uh, the also difficult choices then around tuition. So those are the parallels. And they speak to Chicago, speak to higher ed. And I'm going to echo here a few what I think are just very quickly. What are the, uh, what's the circumstance of recommendation? Um, to begin with, I don't think there's any way out of, when we're looking at the commons, that if we come together as a movement, and I think this is about unions and movement, community-based groups and movement, we can't do this alone, and we can't do this out of a movement politics. We have to begin talking about a radically revamped progressive income tax structure. Money won't solve all these problems, but sure as hell is going to help. The public sector of the commons has been starved, it's increasingly being starved, and one of the remedies for that starvation has to be about investment of various kinds. It's not only about money, it's about strategic investment and how, but it's about money largely. Two, an increased willingness to engage in direct action. Chicago, that's part of what occurred. Wisconsin before it, and there are many other pieces emerging across, but you have to be willing to risk direct action. I don't care what we call it, what the tactics may be, we're going to have to risk more militant forms of action. Creating alliances between public workers and, union, uh, and uh, communities. We serve as public workers communities. We have not capitalized, we've not built the kinds of alliances and relationships that need to be built. Unions do not have the density. It, we can't fool ourselves any longer about that. The 
only way we scale up density to some extent is creating the natural alliances where they exist, and unions and community-based are going to have to drive that process. We need to rethink the prism of union contracts. Union contracts must be about the quality of the service as important, uh, that must be as important as Chicago has done, as frankly the PSC has done as well. Um, that must be as important as the concrete, specific, uh, quantitative benefits to members. Otherwise, we have no basis for imagining authentic partnership with communities. And finally, we have to engage in risk-taking in order to reinvent the work of unions. And that's a very tall order. To imagine that in this moment that we are going to have to reinvent ourselves at the same time we struggle to survive. But that is our work if there's going to be any work in the future of collective purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Our last speaker is Becca. Thanks. So, um, I'm a history teacher in um, the south side of Chicago. I teach ninth grade. Um, and I was obviously um, quite involved in, in the strike as listening to people talk about it. Maybe remember all these different stories. So, I'm going to try to highlight three things and just tell stories about those three things. So the first one is the importance, the importance of democracy in, in the union. Secondly, um, uh, I think Steve talked about this in terms of how quickly consciousness changes. And third, that we're not out of the woods yet. Um, so the first one in terms of democracy in the union, we all knew what we were fighting for. And that's really simple and basic, but unbelievably important. Um, it was mentioned that when the uh, caucus of rank and file educators got into office, they um, had what normally was uh, the, their salaries, but also hired an organizing department, but also a research department. And the research department gave us the tools in terms of actually knowing what we were talking about so that we could go out and do all the door knocking and talk to not only the parents and the students, but also our own colleagues who were not as involved, but weren't necessarily following um, the newspaper, et cetera. We were able to talk about what we were actually fighting for. And the first thing the, um, that this CTU came out with was the school Chicago students deserve. And it's not only goes through what the schools are like, because we know that, you know, we teach there every day. The people who work in the schools know the best about, obviously, the conditions, and the students who go to the schools know the best about the conditions. We knew that we didn't have air conditioning and that we pay for our own supplies and that my department didn't have a photocopy machine for, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, we knew all that stuff, and we could talk to parents about how that was unfair and stuff like that. But uh, the other thing that this um, pamphlet put forward was what to do about it. And so it actually proposed some solutions. So it proposed um, uh, ways in which um, smaller class sizes could actually be funded with um, changing uh, TIF funds, or some tax increment funding, that basically a mayoral slush fund um, in Chicago. And so there were actual proposals in which saying, wait a minute, if we redirect this money back to the schools, which stolen money from our schools and our neighborhoods anyways, if we redirect that, then we can have our smaller class sizes, and we can have our wraparound services, and we can have libraries um, in schools that are south of uh, North Street, which is North Avenue, which is, you know, black and brown neighborhoods. Um, and so that was really important. But then it also um, called on call on the state to say, and demand federally that there's more funding for schools. Demand to, you know, change up the tax system, which I think is, a revenue system, which I think is really important. It also called the end of the wars, et cetera. I mean, it was like, one of those documents was really useful because said, we, we have a giant problem in our society in which we're not actually funding education. And so I think that was um, important, and teachers were talking about it and, and reading it and talking with, with each other. I think the point about um, our working conditions, our students' learning conditions, which is also one of um, one of our mottos, is not just that you know the reality inside the classrooms that are benefit, but also shows well who are our allies. Our allies are our students. Our allies are not. And the mayor tried very very hard. The school board tried very very hard to divide students um, and parents from the teachers. And they said, no, wait a minute. But we're each other's natural allies because we're in this together. We both want the best education um, for our students. We both want the best schools that we can. So that was really important. Um, the other, um, this happened afterwards, but another document that the CTU came out with was the black and white of charter schools, and it really went through the privatization of the racist, um, the racist attack on, on many black and brown neighborhoods, or all black and brown neighborhoods in, in Chicago, and the way in which privatization was focusing on those neighborhoods and not others. So 
we went through, we, we talked about it, and we had discussion groups, and we had, um, I made copies of the abstract of, of this and put in everyone's mailboxes, and we talked about it in our union meetings um, at, at the school, and I think that was really um, a way for people to begin to say, wait a minute, what are we actually fighting for? In every single news report, in every single protest you went to, people knew exactly why they were there. And people were talking about the type of education that we want to imagine. And it also started to say, if Ronald Manuel and you know the, the elite of this city can send their kids to you know the Chicago University Lab School, and these are the conditions of those schools, that's what we deserve, and that's what we want. And actually, there's actions in the making right now of the schools that have been closed. Um, a lot of those students are going to go to the lab school and try to register and say, these are the schools that we want our kids to go to. You're going to close our schools. We're going to go there. Um, we're going to register, and, and we should be allowed to get to, to get in. So that's so that's one thing in terms of in terms of the democracy. The, the actual contract discussions, I think, are really important. So first of all, I work in a school that has probably 120 um, 20 teachers. It's a big school, big high school. Um, and we, in the preparation for the strike, I was really, really nervous. Not one person had been on strike before um, in that school. So none of us had any experience. We didn't have a union delegate, because our previous union delegate was um, targeted by the previous principal and was actually forced out of the school. And so there was a lot of fear within my school. And so coming, leading up to the strike, people were pretty nervous about what this was going to look like and whether we were going to actually gel together and, and, and begin to organize. Um, a, a coworker of mine stepped up, agreed to be, um, agreed to put his name down for, for union delegate, which is really important. Um, and it sort of, you know, took, took charge in doing that. And, and there was a group of us, about five or so, who said, okay, five of us out of, you know, 120 teachers here, we're going to try to form together and figure out, you know, contacts in all the different departments because we don't see each other every day and we're running around doing all these other things. We're going to begin talking about these issues um, around what this fight is going to actually be about. And we began to do those conversations that um, folks talked about, those painstaking um, Conversation. So we so we began to do that, um, and people knew what they were talking about really really quickly. Um, and I thought that, that was a really good sign. I mean, people were reading the newspaper, people were talking with other folks in terms of my coworkers. People started talking to parents. Um, our students were like, you know, pretty like, yeah, you guys know what you got with yours, um, you know, in the 14, 14 and 15 year old language. Um, so that was I think that was really important. And then when we were actually out on strike, I just well. The contract um, discussions at my school were really amazing. I've never been through anything like that before in terms of we just, you know, first of all, we pulled together. We had, um, as Steve said, they were, we did some mock votes before the actual um, strike authorization vote. And so it started from some schools just sort of popping up. And we had heard about it. And actually, through the core listserv, so there's all of us around the city, we started writing in. Someone said, hey, we did a mock vote today at my school, and, and you know, we got 80% in favor of the strike. And so I was like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's start doing that at the, all these different schools. It was not you know, orchestrated from above. Someone just decided to do that and then threw it out over the listserv. So we started doing that at different schools. And at my school, we did the mock vote. And we went on the last speaker and said, we're going to have a mock vote today you know, after school. All, all staff come down. The entire lunch staff which are not in our union, so they're not allowed to vote. But they all said, we want to vote yes. We want you to go out. And so we're like, OK, we'll write that down. <laughs> so you know, the entire uh, cafeteria workers were like fully, fully on board with us, which was a great, a great sign. And then when we actually did the strike authorization vote, one person did not vote in my entire school. So 119 out of the 120 um, teachers um, registered their vote. And obviously, it was, you know, it was a secret ballot, but I'm sure that people were very, very um, in favor of a strike, op op strike authorization. Um, and so there were important moments where um, you could see how quickly people's confidence confidence was building. And I think that that was, um, that was particularly clear of leading straight up to the strike. And so um, in May at this rally that, that was mentioned, I think for the first time we said, okay, we're not by ourselves. We went to this big rally downtown, 4,000 4, of us. My school, we were like up in like the top, the top tier. And it was like a sea of red everywhere. And my coworkers, we looked around and said, so we're not the only ones who feel like this. And it was the first time that we really looked around and said the entire, all of the whole union is on board with us. Like 
we're all feeling the same thing. We walked through the streets and everyone was saying the same thing. But then I thought it was the most amazing thing. When we were walking down, there were people who were, you know, office workers putting up signs that, mm -hmm. like on, on pieces of paper that said, we support you. You know, someone just like scribbled it down really quickly and stuck it on, on the window. Or um, baristas coming out of the coffee shops giving us thumbs up. And, I, and for that moment, I was like, we have a chance. Like for me, I, you know, I, I was pretty confident that we were probably going to get up to a, to a point where we were going to, you know, authorize a strike and do that. But I didn't have any concept of the city backing us <laughs> until that moment when we marched through downtown. And I started saying, okay, other, you know, it's not just us. We're not alone. But then we look at, you know, the working class of Chicago is giving us a thumbs up. And that's a good sign. And we continued organizing over the summer. Um, and right before the strike, you know, we had our phone trees. I was a strike captain, so I had my 12 people to call the night before. Went through calling everyone. So we're going out, you know, show up at you know, 6, 6.30 tomorrow morning, make sure you wear your red, you know, and calling through everyone and, and get trying to figure out, you know, who was, who, who was nervous, who wasn't nervous, um, who was, and everyone was sort of like, well, what do we do when we get there? Like, I don't know, I've never been on strike before. <laughs> I was like, I think we pick it. <laughs> you know, and so we were like, so we got there, we started picketing, and I was like, oh, this is exhausting. Um, <laughs> I really have to keep marching. Um, and so then, you know, it was sort of like the getting used to it and building a more confidence. We had um, parents come by bringing us food. You know, we had some students who came out and marched with us. My school was a school where the students were supposed to be sent, so they opened up what they called contingency schools for parents. and. So my school is a high school, um, 1,800 kids. I think maybe 20 kids showed up that day, um, and they showed up to play basketball mm -hmm. in, in the gym, and then and then left. And basically, by the next day, there were maybe five students showed up or something like that. So it was really clear that the parents were on our side. They were keeping their kids away. They didn't want their kids to necessarily come. We had some students who marched on the or hung out on the picket line with us, which was which was nice as well to see that kind of solidarity. Um, and then we had different actions every day that we decided on, our, you know, on our own. And so one day we decided, okay, we're in a neighborhood, we're not too far from Obama's house. Let's march around the neighborhood, let's go to Obama's house, and, you know, so we're marching down there, we're, we're chanting, um, and this is at the point where Obama hadn't said anything about the strike. So we're, we're marching, hey, uh, hey Obama, take a, take a stand, give us what we demand. Right, so we just wanted to, you know, come out, you know, say you support the teachers, you know, regardless. So we start marching, and we get maybe half a block away, and all of a sudden, cold feet. So there's like maybe 200 of us, with us and our supporters, and another another school came and joined us, and the the, the head of the march sort of veers away, goes down the side of the street, goes back to the school. So we didn't quite make it on that first day. The second day, we we're like, okay, well, we're going to go to a board member's house because he lives in the neighborhood too. So we we'll march over to David Vitale's house, and we had a, we were chanting outside, you know, shame, shame. Um, you know, there were a whole bunch of us this day because two other schools came and joined us in this march, so there, we were building up confidence. And then one of my coworkers, his uh, math teacher, veteran, uh, well-respected teacher, starts screaming, Obama's house, Obama's house, <laughs> and everyone starts marching off towards Obama's house. And so we have this protest outside of, well, not really outside of Obama's house, because Obama was on the corner, and so the, the uh, Secret Service is in front of his house, but in front of the Secret Service, we begin um, a, a, a bit of a protest. Um, you know, we were only there for maybe two minutes, but my, everyone in my school was like, yeah, we did it, okay. We were able to actually gain the confidence to, 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 have, that, to have that protest, and we marched on, and people, um, and down sort of the main street where there's stores and stuff, the, the workers in the, in the stores had hung up our um, We Support the Chicago Teachers signs and things like that. And I think that act, those two days where it went from, are we bold enough to do something like this? We're actually, you know, demanding the, pre you know, it's symbolic, but demanding the president to take a stand to actually feel like we're able to do that and then feel very confident about that was pretty, was pretty um, impressive. And then, of course, I, you know, text out to the other folks in core and the other like, oh, we just marched on Obama's house. And then at a meeting later that night, um, Jackson Potter, one of the organizers, goes, yeah, and there's a school that marched on Obama's house. So, <laughs> um, and so the sort of communication, you know, I was hearing about
about, you know, one, one school uh, was, you know, had a pretty sad picket, so they decided to go to like a busy intersection instead. So we were, on the first day of the strike, texting the other, you know, militants in the union, what are you doing in your school? What does it look like? Who's coming by? What, you know, giving, trying to give each other ideas, because none of us have any experience before um, doing this. And so that was really, really helpful. And the la in the last day of the strike, when we were going back over our contract, I mean, first of all, the debate in the House of Delegates meeting was not really a debate about whether or not to take another day. So people were like, no, we're going to go back, we're going to show our coworkers, we're going to read through this contract, we're going to see what's there in order for us to make a decision. The real debate was whether it should be one day or two days, because the next day was Rosh Hashanah. And there was a big debate about whether or not we can go back if our Jewish brothers and sisters are not going to be able to be at a House of Delegates meeting because they'll be at Temple um, or you know, celebrating the holiday. And so, I mean, it was, it, was, it was like a small debate, but it was really touching in a lot of ways because people said, we're in this together. We're not going to let you know, one group of teachers out and not be part of this discussion. So we're going to take the two days and, and basically the media and the public will deal with it we're going to figure it out. And that was pretty, um, pretty inspiring. And so coming back to my, to my school, we all, um, my coworker and I went to, went to Kinko's, made a bunch of copies for everyone to have, uh, a bunch of copies of the contract. So we had a big stack of them, handed them out to the 110 people who, who showed up. Um, we're sitting there for the first two hours annotating, line by line, circling the stuff that we thought was you know, horrible, you know, Xing the things. Um, you know, putting stars next to things, you're like, oh yeah, this is important. And I think what's, remember at the beginning of the strike, or before we went out, Rob Emanuel basically said, we want to turn your contract into 20 pages. Right? We want to turn your 200 page contract into this teeny little outline, so you're going to have no workplace um, you know, rights at all, right? It won't mention it in the contract. And the fact that we were able to hold, hold the ground, I think, is a victory um, in and of itself. And we went through, and then we walked to, um, went through annotate, and then we all walked to a neighborhood in the park, sat on the bleachers, and read the contract out loud, <laughs> article by article, and had a discussion, article by article, about our contract. This was the first time probably 80% of the people had read the contract. And so now we have a faculty where 100% of the people have read the contract, which is probably better than 98%, I'm making up statistics right now, but <laughs> probably better, clearly not a math teacher, probably better than 98% of workplaces in, in this country. Um, but we actually have read the contract, discussed the contract, um, and in Article 1, it, it, um, in our contract, it says that every school uh, workplace should have a professional problems committee, which is the union delegate plus a small elected team to meet with the principal on a regular basis. And so that's um, after in, in order to um, deal with issues before grievances come up. And so one of the reasons why this was so important is that my school hadn't had a professional problems committee um, before. We now have one that's functioning. And one of CORE's real goals has been to try to get PPCs, professional problem committees, up in all the schools that we can, that we have members at, or, or have them be as functional as possible so we can actually enforce the contract. Because the contract is only as good as you can enforce it. And I think that's something that we're beginning, we're you know, ways and ways and ways to go, but we moved in the right direction um, around that. And then the last thing just to say is that we, you know, this is a huge victory. I mean, Rom, you know, <laughs> he thought he was going to destroy us. He really did. He thought he was going to annihilate us, um, and he didn't. And we came out stronger. Um, because of that. Our union came out stronger, and frankly, the working class of Chicago came out stronger in that we said, wait a minute, we're, on this, we're on, in the same boat, we're on the same page, we're, we have some allies. That said, we're getting hammered. Um, and so, they're closing 50 schools in Chicago, um, the largest school closing um, ever um, in, in the United States. Um, we've been protesting, we've gone to hearings, we've um, they didn't have to the Board of Education. We went on a three-day march where we started in the south side, another group started, I was on the south side, another group started on the west side. We marched from school to school to school for three days um, in um, sort of solidarity and all the tradition of civil rights marches going through these neighborhoods that have been completely neglected by the city. Okay, <laughs> I'll be quiet. Um, uh, and, and 
so going through these neighborhoods and really, um, and we protested and there were, you know, probably 2,000 people, maybe more than that, um, over the course of, course of the weekend, um, and, and we lost. And so one of the realities is that this austerity is, is, is continuing. Um, I just got a text yesterday from my coworker who said, you know, they're doing a change in funding, we're going to lose probably a 20% uh, reduction in our operating budget, it might be mass layoffs. We just looked at what happened to Philadelphia um, a few days ago in their mass layoffs. So that this is the reality, austerity is continuing and they're going to, and you know, they're trying to get us one way or, uh, or another, but I think what's really important is that it's very clear that we're fighting for um, the, the real heart and soul of, of public education. If we don't fight, we're not going to have public education. And I think people understand the stakes. And I think teachers are beginning to talk and understand the stakes. And I think that this is um, not only a fight around, obviously, public education, but the only way that we're going to win is if it's also a civil rights struggle. And I think that that's something that's been so inspiring, is that this fight around saving the schools and our strike, I think, at the same, is trying to pull together a movement. And I've never been part of a mass movement before, but I really feel like I'm part of sort of the beginning of knitting together a mass movement that can save public education and really take on racism in this country, which I think is really amazing. So I'll be quiet.
NEA affiliate are the most powerful force. I mean, there's each local. So you have 600 buildings. We have 438 separate locals, each of which has its own contract uh, that are scattered over a huge area. And we're trying to build something like you uh, that has learned a lot from you and that always looks to you either in reality or in myth for constructing what we're doing. But our challenges are different both because of the geographic spread, because we aren't exactly facing the same enemy, though a whole lot of things are handed down from the state so that it took away our right to bargain about health care, it took away seniority provisions and made it the best interests of the child, it, it, you know, it's taking away our retiree health care benefits. And thank God we're in a state that was dominated by Democrats and with a Democratic governor and so on. So for us, the, ch the challenge besides the geographic one and the, the spread is um, the states, the cities and towns with the 10% of them with the highest test scores have average incomes, household incomes over $100,000 a year. The 10% with the lowest test scores have average in incomes under $50,000 a year. Peculiarly, a lot of the really affluent districts um, have significant numbers of teachers that are very active in our reform organization. I mean, we also have a bunch from, from some of the poorest districts, but I wonder if you have any advice or thoughts on yeah, I'm Lisa Sasso. I live in Chicago. I was uh, privileged to participate as a solidarity activist and as a, as a parent and a, as a journalist in the struggle. And I just want to maybe just flesh out a couple of points that were made by speakers from Chicago. I think one thing with the, with, with, when the union turned out this message, one thing they did was organize a bunch of demonstrations, which probably a lot of the members were curious about. Like, why are we picking a car dealership? And it had to do with the fact that tax money that was taken away from schools went to subsidize, you know, this, this uh, seller of luxury cars, and therefore we should have a ticket. And by, it took a year or so, but not only the members, but the local media became trained to understand that tax increment financing means money stolen from the uh, kids. So, so it was easy to portray Rom as, as mayor 1% because of a lot of work that people went into. Picking the Mortgage Bankers Association along with Occupy back in, in 20, uh, a year ahead of time, 2011. Um, and I think another point that was needs to be emphasized is not only did the AFT, I mean, bystanders is the best thing you could say. The Chicago Federation of Labor was rushing to get on bed with Rahm on his private, uh, his infrastructure deal, which was a, a kind of a sweetheart deal with the banks to, to fund uh, uh, basic uh, uh, basic needs of the city. Um, they they uh, they undercut the CTU on health care issues and settled early and so forth. And still, despite being relatively isolated, the CTU was able to win because they had taken this question of community organizing uh, and social unionism so seriously. Before they got into office, they organized against school closures, pushed the union itself into doing that. One of you uh, pushed back. And they made it clear that this wasn't just about uh, mobilizing people for to support our issues. That we we're defending public education. And that went through. And so now, consequently, and I think the fruits of it was only just seen in the last weeks with this fight against the school closures, which is the movement. I, I, you know, I'm thinking there's this, uh, you know, the, the conservative South, white South Side Irish um, a woman who's teaching me lessons about privatization and school reform in an interview that I did with her, an African-American minister who worked as a social worker in the school for 18 years before starting a church, uh, to the Puerto Rican mother who's uh, watching her kids' uh, schools being closed, where she went to, as Puerto Ricans are pushed out of their fourth neighborhood since World War II. It's all the same movement, and consciously so. I mean, people understand that. And the CTU was able to use the, its resources to do that. Now, it's a much bigger lift to make up for you know, 20 something years of fragmented community organizing of people of color and the working class in Chicago than dealing with the union as a whole, but it's an important, uh, it's a crucial step because I think people are learning generational lessons like they did in the early 30s in labor and like they did in the early 60s with civil rights. I mean, it's, 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 it, you're, you're seeing a cadre of people come together. It's not yet a mass movement, I would say, but it's really critical and the work that people did. I'm looking, you know, Steve still looks tired from getting up at 3 a.m. to you know, staff the strike headquarters. And, you know, and, 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 you know, and Becca, all the work that she and all the other um, members did, was, was really incredible. And it was like two or 3,000 people across the city did that, I would say, among teachers. And then th that number again among community organizers. And they're still, they're still together, they're still in touch. And I think finally, the transformation of the membership, I think was just completed in the course of this re-election. Because it's one thing to go out and strike and beat Rom, and he's frustrated and so on. It's another thing to actually live through this honors health care program. Yeah, you don't have to pay for it like the other workers in the city did. But you know, you have to deal with Big Brother to keep your health care costs low. You've got this longer school day, which is horrible for kids and horrible for teachers. 
and a number of other things that, 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 that you know, frankly suck. And yet people realize, well, we stopped them. Oh, we stopped their momentum. But we held the line. Now we have to do, we have to do this again in three years. And to go up with 79%, I think it was, with 60% voter turnout was really incredible. I mean, it's a statement that finally people said, yes, we did this. This is who we are. And that, that, you can't have that kind of, that was not a reflexive, inertia-driven, oh, let's return the same old people. That was a considered vote about what have we accomplished and what do we have to do in the future. And I think that's just as much a lesson that needs to be drawn out of this as some of the organizing that's been taking place. It's really quite been something to behold. especially when you have meager resources. 
But it starts from us saying, I mean, right now what we're facing in New York are, as Megan said, the greatest change in our working conditions, probably in a generation, if not greater, with this, uh, you know, this evaluation deal. Um, and the union is going to say, as it said for many years, it's likely to say to people, when they come with complaints, when they come with abuses, there's nothing we can do. And we're going to have to be the people who, despite the fact that the big powerful union is saying there's nothing you can do, throw up your hands, we're going to have to be people who say, no, there is something. We're going to figure out a way to fight back. We're going to figure out a way to push back against this, and in a climate of tremendous fear, in a you know bad economic situation, that sort of thing. So that's one of the things we've taken to heart. I just want to say one other quick thing, if I can, which is that there has historically been a division in New York in the union among the union activists between the people who saw themselves as kind of like the radical educators who really cared and paid special attention to issues like racism, things like that, and on the other hand, the kind of trade unionist people who brought their experience from the labor movement into being a teacher and saw it primarily as a thing about contracts and unionism and this sort of thing, and not as much about the social questions. And the problem is, well, the, the problem is that this attack on public education has raised tremendous social issues in the context of destroying unions. And they, the people attacking, are promising racial justice. They're promising that this is going to be the new civil rights movement, blah, 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 blah. And so it's become impossible, both <coughs> camps have been right now. I mean, you can't just close your door and just do your like social justice pedagogy because they've battered down your door and they now dictate from 3,000 miles away exactly what you're going to be doing or else you're not going to have a job. And you can't just do bread and butter unionism anymore because the stark racial and economic patterns are staring you in the face and parents are asking good questions like, well, why is this school in this condition? And these other ones are not. And if you can't answer those questions, then you can't win them to your side. And so I think it's not just like a moral thing. It's that the CTU highlights the strategic centrality of anti-racism in this moment. Because it's so, they have figured out the strategic centrality of it. Racism is so central to the way they're getting away with all of this. It either is going to be a sword in their hands, or it's going to be a sword in our hands. And I really feel like the, it's one of the main things that CTU highlighted for us. Oh, Chip, 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 Chip,